It is a great honor to be here, my first time here. And as Dr. Lawson mentioned last night, as, as well as Dr. Allen, it is uh, an incredible joy to be with uh, dear friends that we have so much in common with, uh, but rarely get to see each other. And so to be with Steve and, and Jason and uh, Don Carson and later, it's just uh, thank you for letting us uh, um, do that. Um, Dr. Lawson is such a great, consistent model of preaching the Bible. And uh, just reveled in that last night. You know, there are a lot of people who live in places where uh, they can't get that in person. I mean, in a metropolitan area like Houston, if someone is willing to drive a uh, great distance, they can go to a church where the Bible is consistently preached. But there are a lot of people in a lot of places where it's not possible. They'd have to drive for hours and hours. And not only are you blessed to have this here in your local church, but to have conferences uh, like this where you hear someone like Dr. Lawson who travels all over the country and the world and need modeling this, modeling expository preaching. We're grateful for your ambassadorship for the expository preaching like that, Steve. Well, I um, want to get right into this uh, since um, time is limited here. I want you to imagine that you are praying and as you are suddenly, unexpectedly, an angel appears to you. And this angel says to you, first of all, let me address the men here. God is giving you a miracle with your pitching arm. And you're going to be enabled to throw a new kind of pitch with a baseball. And regardless of your age, your physical condition right now, this pitch is going to move and dance something like a knuckleball. It's going to be so unhittable that this October, you will be pitching in the World Series for the Houston Astros. But you must practice an hour every day. Or for you ladies, the angel says, God is giving you a miraculous singing voice. It's going to be unlike anything the world has ever heard. And it's going to so take the world by storm that this October you will open the World Series. Is it Minute Maid Park? Is that the name the ballpark here? Yeah. By singing the national anthem, but you must practice an hour every day. And then poof, the angel's gone. Well, I mean, immediately you go outside. You begin throwing the baseball against the side of the house hour after hour. That is all you want to do. Or you begin singing the national anthem just hour after hour. That's all you want to do because God told you to do it. And you're going to be in the World Series. Well, a couple of weeks go by and life's busy, but hey, no problem. God told you to do it and you're going to be in the World Series. But another couple of weeks go by, and life's starting to pile up now, you know. And uh, so you find it rather difficult, but you do it, after all, because God told you to do it. And another couple of weeks go by, and you can hardly make yourself invest that hour a day. Yes, yes, you know God has told you to do it, but God's told you to do lots of other things as well that you're to do. Do your work and care for your home, raise your kids and serve in your local church and be a good citizen and neighbor and so forth. You know what you need to remember at that point? At that point where that discipline becomes such drudgery, you need to remember what you're going to become. You're going to be pitching in the World Series for crying out loud. You're going to be singing before the whole world at the opening of the World Series. When you can remember that, that discipline is no drudgery. Well, sadly, the same thing can happen when it comes to the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. Reading the Bible can be just another thing to do in an already overloaded, overbusy schedule. Prayer can threaten to be mere drudgery as you say the same old things about the same old things. If that's a problem, by the way, we'll talk about that. 9 o'clock Sunday morning, God will. And the purpose of something like fasting or some other discipline just seems totally irrelevant and totally not workable in your schedule. When that happens, as it inevitably will, you know what you need to remember? It's what you're going to become. Well, the Bible says of God's elect in Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew... 
He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son in order that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. Well, I left some things out there, right? Whom he foreknew, you also predestined. Those whom he predestined, uh, these he also uh, called. And those whom he called, these he also justified. These whom he justified, these he also glorified. But we are predestined in Christ to be made like Christ. All those in Christ, the Bible says there, are predestined to be made like Jesus Christ, not like him in his divinity, as the Mormons believe. We're not going to be little gods. Rather, we'll be made like him in his sinless, perfect humanity, reflecting the glory of God from every cell and every pore of our bodies. And that's no mere angelic promise. If you're in Christ, that's you in a few years. Well then, if that's going to be so, and it is, 1 John 3, 2 and 3 says, it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, we shall see him as he is. So if that's so, and if God has predestined that, that all those in Christ will be made like Christ, then why talk about discipline at all? Why not just coast on into heaven and enjoy the ride? Well, there's a little verse tucked away in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, which says strive, some translations say pursue, very active word there, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive for, pursue peace with all men and the holiness. Some translations say sanctification. We could say godliness, Christ-likeness, without which who will see the Lord? No one. Regardless of profession of faith, regardless of how long or how many times they've been to church, regardless of how much money they've given to the church or how much they've served in the church, anyone not pursuing holiness will not see the Lord. You know why? Because they don't know the Lord. Anyone not pursuing Christ's likeness, I submit, has not met the man. How could anyone know Jesus, not be compelled to be with him and to be like him? Now, let's be very clear. It's crucial to understand it is not our pursuit of holiness that impresses God and causes him to throw open the door of heaven. He is impressed by only one life. He is impressed by the discipline, by the practice, by the good works of only one life, and that is the life of Jesus. And it is his works that makes us acceptable. So is our salvation by works? Oh, you bet it is, but not yours. Someone worked for it, and Jesus worked 33 years of perfect righteousness, always keeping the law of God, every moment, 24-7, loving God with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, all his strength, his neighbor as himself, never once, despite the ongoing temptations of the world and the constant temptations of the devil and the onslaughts of the of the enemies who were constantly criticizing and falsely accusing him not once in all those times despite his fatigue or anything else did he ever just kind of lose it for a second you know but get it under control again not one second not one moment did he ever break a lot god's law not one second not for one moment did he ever fail to keep god's law and jesus earned heaven by a perfect life. And that qualified him to be a substitute for lawbreakers like us. And he willingly offered himself on the cross as a substitute. And God accepted that substitutionary sacrifice, we know, because God raised him from the dead and ascended him to heaven where he sits today and from which he will come someday and judge over all the earth. And when we, by faith, believe into Christ. And you've heard of being united with Christ by faith. And that's what believe really means. We don't just believe on, we believe into Christ. And when we believe we are united with Christ, we believe into him and we are given credit for his life. Think of that. God looks at you as though you spoke the words of Jesus, as though you healed all those people, as though you had the perfectly pure heart of Christ, as though you had the perfectly pure mind of Jesus Christ. 
You get credit for his life. And on the cross, Jesus got credit for my life. And you know what? My life got the perfectly pure son of God. The atomic bomb of the wrath of God. And when we believe into Christ, given credit for his life, justified, we're given what spirit? The Holy Spirit, who is not, according to LifeWay, 40% of Southern Baptists believe is a force. He is a person. And the person of the Holy Spirit indwells those who are believers in Jesus Christ. And so if you're a Christian, think of this now, two people live in your body. If you're a Christian who's an expectant mom here this morning, three people live in your body. <laughs> and that other person is not passive. And when the Holy Spirit lives in any flesh and blood creature, I mean, there's change, right? There's difference. It's inconceivable that the Holy Spirit of Almighty God could indwell any flesh and blood creature and it not be changed. That he could dwell there and not have an effect, that there not be evidence of his presence. And among the ways you can know if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit is you have new holy hungers. You didn't have before the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You hunger for the Holy Word of God that you used to find boring or irrelevant. You hunger for fellowship with God's people. I don't mean mere socializing with people you have a lot in common with. You hunger for fellowship. And the word koinonia, meaning fellowship, means you don't just want to socialize. You don't just want to talk about news, weather, sports, work, family, politics. That's good, healthy, normal. The godliest Christians do a lot of socializing. But I think nearly always when we say the word fellowship, the picture we get in our mind is just socializing. But fellowship is when we talk about God and the things of God. I contend we do much less of that than we think, even at church. I mean, just reflect on the conversations you've had since you got out of your car here this morning. How many of them had anything to do with God and the things of God? Now, that doesn't mean there's anything sinful about anything that you said or talked about. But did it have to do with, directly with God and the things of God? That's koinonia. That's fellowship. And a Christian by the Holy Spirit craves that. Now, that means that you, you just can't live apart from the people of God because you recognize that the Spirit of God dwells in your brothers and sisters in Christ, and so much of the Spirit's ministry to you is through them. And to cut yourself off from fellowship with God's people is in a very real sense to cut yourself off from fellowship with the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you. You can't bear that. And so you long to be in a place where you talk about God and the things of God, and I trust that's one of the main things that drew you to this conference. You're going to hear more about God and the things of God. And these kind of discussions would come up between the sessions and so forth. This, is, this whole thing is about learning more about God and experiencing Him, and so you wanted to be here. The presence of the Holy Spirit gives you new holy longings you didn't have before the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You long to live in a holy body without sin anymore. You long to live with a holy mind that's no longer attracted to temptation ever again. You long to live in a holy and perfect world where there's no more racism and there's no more terrorism and there's no more traffic jams and there's no more floods and hurricanes. And you long to live in that holy and perfect world with holy and perfect people, what Jonathan Edwards called a world of love. And you long to live there and at last, like those creatures around the throne, see the one the angels call holy, holy, holy. The Holy Spirit causes these holy hungerings, these holy longings, these holy desires. And you're in the grip of that. As Edward said, these are no idle, ineffectual desires. You don't just kind of have them resonant within you. They're not idle. They're not ineffectual. They, they drive you. They move you. 
And so that's why Hebrews 12, 14 can say, if you're not pursuing holiness, you're not indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You won't see the Holy One. You don't earn it by your pursuit of holiness. That pursuit of it indicates that you already know Him. He's given you the Holy Spirit and you're just inexorably drawn toward Him. You're in the grip of a groan that just pulls you Godward and toward holiness. Longing for that time when you'll be made completely holy in body and mind. Well then, if, as the Bible says, we're not pursuing holiness, Christ-likeness, godliness, we're not going to see the Lord. How do we do that? If that's the theological truth, and it is, that that's what the Bible teaches, and it does, you will not see the Lord for not pursuing holiness. Practically, how do we do that? Well, the answer is in the text I want to focus on for the rest of my time, and that's 1 Timothy 4.7. which I'm preaching today from the ESV, but my preferred translation, the one I see in Dr. Lawson's lap, is the New American Standard, which says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. The first part of the verse says, Have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. Now, I'm hopeful tonight, I'm going to preach on the second half of that. I'm hopeful Dr. Lawson will take up the first half of that tonight. Say, these are not just women here, these are old women that are spoken of, and you let him expound that. <laughs> ESV says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. King James says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. We'll talk about that word there just a little bit. But I prefer the translation, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. If you let me sort of draw it in the air, there's three parts to this. Discipline yourself. Why? Well, there's a purpose. You discipline yourself for the purpose. What is that? For the purpose of godliness. The command is discipline yourself. And there's a reason for that, for the purpose. The purpose is godliness, Christ-likeness, holiness. Without that, you're not going to see the Lord. If that's your purpose, if your purpose is godliness, Christ-likeness, and it is if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you don't just choose this. He causes that to be your purpose. You find godliness, Christ-likeness, compelling so how do, you, how do you live that out? How do you pursue that? If it's no idle, ineffectual desire, as Edward said, how do you pursue that? The Bible says you discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And the practical, everyday, shoe-leather kinds of ways that we obey this verse have typically been called the spiritual disciplines. Now, I have been criticized for using the term spiritual disciplines. And the reason is there are a lot of people who are to the left of where I am theologically in the area of spirituality who write using the term spiritual disciplines. Or sometimes as the old term is spiritual exercises. And so the presumption has been, this a guilt by association, if you use the term spiritual disciplines, you believe everything that those who use the term believe. Well, I mean, a lot of heretics will use the term trinity. We're not going to abandon that term because they're heretics. That doesn't make us heretics because we use the term trinity and they use the term trinity. But I've been asked, where do you get this term spiritual disciplines? Why do you use that term? Well... The text says, in the most literal translation, I think, the New American Standard, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And we know it's not talking about physical discipline, mainly because the very next verse, verse 7 ends with a comma, the very next verse says, for bodily discipline is of little profit. Some profit may 
give you a more healthy life in this world. But godliness, it says, is profitable for all things because it lasts for eternity and so forth. So bodily discipline is only of a little profit. And it's contrasted with the discipline spoken of in verse 7. So we're to discipline ourselves, but bodily discipline is only a little profit, but it's talking about another kind of discipline. What is it if it's not bodily discipline? And it's spiritual discipline, right? And we also know by observation that it's not physical discipline that's spoken of here in verse 7, because if that were true, bodybuilders would be the godless people on the planet, right? So clearly, it is spiritual discipline that is spoken of in verse 7, and the practical biblical ways by which we engage in spiritual discipline. Those things have been called spiritual disciplines. And so I want to, my, my first point here is what, what are the spiritual disciplines? So the spiritual disciplines, what are they? And at least half of my time, I'll have about three points. Half of the time will be on this, this first one here. These are the practices found in Scripture that promote spiritual growth among believers in the gospel of Jesus. Talking about habits of devotion and of experiential Christianity that have been practiced by the people of God since the times of the Bible. Let me uh, characterize them for you. I'm going to give you about six different ways we can characterize the spiritual disciplines. First of all, we want to think of them as both personal and interpersonal. That's one way we can characterize the spiritual disciplines. There are personal spiritual disciplines, those you practice alone. And there are interpersonal or corporate, congregational spiritual disciplines we practice with other Christians. So I've written a book that was, I think you were given. I didn't know that. Spiritual disciplines for the Christian life. That is primarily about personal spiritual disciplines. I've written another book called Spiritual Disciplines Within the Church. So, for example, a personal spiritual discipline would be personal prayer. And Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount... Right? When you pray, go into your inner room, close the door. Your Father who sees in secret will hear you. It's personal prayer, personal spiritual discipline. But the Bible also teaches us to pray with the church. That's an interpersonal, corporate, congregational discipline. We're to read the Bible, meditate on Scripture all alone. That's a personal discipline. We're also, the Bible tells us, to hear the Bible read with the church, 1 Timothy 4.13 here. We're to hear it preached we're here it taught with the church, like we're doing now. This is a congregational, interpersonal spiritual discipline. We're to worship God privately, but the Bible also teaches us to worship Him with the church. Some of the spiritual disciplines by nature are personal. Solitude, by definition, you do alone. You keep a spiritual journal, you do that by yourself. Fasting, though not always, but is often done alone. Some of the spiritual disciplines by nature are interpersonal. Fellowship, for example, we've talked about, that requires people, doesn't it? To hear the Word of God preached requires a preacher and hearers. The Lord's Supper, Jesus commanded us, right? Do this in remembrance of me. But we don't engage in the, in the Lord's Supper individually. We don't serve the Lord's Supper to ourselves and our personal devotional life or to our families. This is given to the church. We're to experience that only with the church or under the authority of, with the knowledge of the local church. And I mention this and dwell on this because this is such an issue today when people think of spirituality, even in the church, they almost always think of personal spirituality. Of course, spirituality is huge in our culture right now. I'm a professor of biblical spirituality, so this is an area of study for me. And I, everybody's spiritual today. I right? try to find anybody who says, you know, I'm just not very spiritual. I have a survey from the front of USA Today where a majority of atheists consider themselves spiritual people. But it's always in the context of privatized spirituality, isn't it? That is not New Testament spirituality. It's part of it. But spirituality, Christ-likeness, is not just those things we do alone, and we're inclined to think that. So as we talk about spiritual disciplines, it's very important to realize that it's not just the personal side, there's the interpersonal, congregational side. And we're to practice both. We all have a tendency to kind of lean a little more one way or the other. 
Some of us like to be alone. We're energized more when we're alone. Well, many people would say, you know, I get more out of my personal spiritual disciplines and I often do in, in congregational worship. And I'd be content just to take my personal spiritual disciplines and go off and be an evangelical monk, an evangelical nun. I don't need that ungodly half committed bunch down at the church. They only slow me down anyway. <laughs> but people who'd come Friday night, early Saturday morning for a conference like this, could be inclined a little more in the other direction. The kind of people who think, you know, my, if I'm at the church pretty much every time the doors are open, and I am, and if I profit from that, as I do, I, I'm pretty sure kind of at the end of it all, that will compensate for the lack of a personal devotional life. No, it won't. So no matter which way you're inclined, we need both. Because first of all, the Bible teaches both. And second, because Jesus practiced both, and he is our example of walking with God, our example of spirituality. And he's much more than that. He's our Lord, our Savior, our King, our friend, our substitute, our judge. But he's not less than our example. He is not only the author of spiritual life, he is the example of it. And Jesus practiced both, the personal and the interpersonal. At least five times in the Gospels, it tells us Jesus got alone to be with the Father. So we need to do that too. But Dr. Luke tells us in chapter 4 of his Gospel, as his custom was, he was in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So even though he had this messianic ministry to fulfill, he knew he had a short time to do it. All these people to teach, all this healing to do. Yet once every week, he would pull aside from that and sit and listen to some dusty old rabbi preach what must have been to him a boring sermon. <laughs> I think only a preacher can really understand what I say when I mean Jesus must have often sat there thinking, boy, I could do better than that. <laughs> or, man, that guy just butchered that verse. <laughs> oh, yeah? How do you know? Well, I wrote it, yeah. <laughs> but he was there. Every week he was there. Why? Because it was the appointed time for the people of God to gather. And Jesus said, those are my people, and I want to be numbered among them. He didn't want it to be said, oh, you're the Messiah, huh? Then how come when the people of God are supposed to be gathered, you're out here doing your own thing? He said, no, those are my people. I want to be counted among them. So when it was time for the people of God together, he was there. Jesus practiced both the personal and the interpersonal spiritual disciplines. The Bible teaches both. We all need both. So when we talk about spiritual disciplines, don't just think of the personal spiritual disciplines. Second way we can categorize them is that they are activities. They're not attitudes. Spiritual disciplines are activities, not attitudes. They're things you do. So the spiritual disciplines are activities. They're not the fruit of the Spirit. They're not graces. They're not character qualities. They're activities. Now, you can do those activities rightly or wrongly. They are biblical activities, but you can do them mechanically, outwardly, hypocritically, or you can do them sincerely and genuinely. But in either case, spiritual disciplines are activities. Now, we're back to this old distinction of doing versus being. Spiritual disciplines are things you do. They're not being. But the goal is the being. The goal is to be like Jesus. The goal is to be with Jesus. The goal is to be godly. Remember, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That's the goal. But we don't just sit back and wait for God to zap us with godliness. We are to pursue godliness by the means God has ordained. Those personal and interpersonal spiritual disciplines God has ordained for the pursuit of godliness. So, therefore, we don't speak of the discipline of joy. Joy is the fruit of discipline done rightly. We don't speak of the discipline of peace. Peace should result from disciplines of the word and prayer done rightly. So that's the goal, the fruit of the Spirit, Christ-likeness. That's what we're after, but we pursue it by means of certain things that we are to 
do. Third, I want to limit the spiritual disciplines to those that are biblical, those found in the Bible, taught or modeled in the Bible. And if we don't have this limitation, because you might say, well, isn't this kind of obvious? But we have to be intentional about this, because without it, we're leaving ourselves open to calling anything we want a spiritual discipline. Some might say, well, you know, maybe, maybe prayer works well for you, but exercise is like a spiritual discipline for me. Some might say, well, maybe meditation on the Bible works for you, but gardening is like a spiritual discipline for me. I feel close to God when I'm in his creation and, and so forth. Well, I, I think I understand what they mean, and that's the way you ought to do it. But if we consecrate, so to speak, something we want as a spiritual discipline, that puts us in charge of our spiritual life and not God. God knows the practices in which we need to engage for the cultivation of godliness. And we don't have the right to choose just whatever we want in the world and pronounce that a spiritual discipline. And furthermore, what would we choose? It's only going to be those things we want anyway, right? Would anybody ever want to proclaim fasting as spiritual discipline? No, they just want to proclaim something they already like to do anyway. Fourth, I take the position that the spiritual disciplines we find in Scripture are sufficient. Speaking particularly to the theme of this conference. The spiritual disciplines found in Scripture are sufficient for knowing and experiencing God and for becoming like Christ. Every spiritual practice we need to experience God to the full is found in the Bible. Every practice we need to become as Christ-like as is humanly possible is found in the Bible. And I realize I'm speaking to people who probably just automatically nod at something like that. But let me develop why this is important. Well, first of all, I mean, it comes from the passage that Dr. Allen preached on last night, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The Bible itself claims a sufficiency for spirituality. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That's what spirituality is, right? That's what the disciplines are. They're training in righteousness. But that's not all. So not only is it profitable in that sense, but it's so that the man of God may be complete, right? And thoroughly equipped for how many good works? Every good work. So it's ordained for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly thoroughly equipped for every good work, including the good work of becoming like Christ. So the Bible claims a sufficiency in terms of spirituality. You don't need any practice not found in Scripture to experience God or to grow in Christ's likeness. Now, there are people who will say, you know, every time I come to church, it seems like they tell me to get in the Bible and pray. You know, I've tried that. I've done that for so many years, but frankly, it doesn't work for me. I read the Bible. I read three chapters a day. I'll try to close it. I can't remember a thing I've read. Well, I have some 22-year-old geniuses in my classes at the seminary with the same problem. So it's not your age. It's not your IQ. It's not your education. It's your method. Look, I think it's on pages 46 to 69 of the book that you were given. Not right now, but <laughs> there's a simple, permanent, biblical solution to that problem. And people say, look, I pray, but every time I pray, you know, I say the same old things about the same old things, and it's boring. It shouldn't be, but it is. I guess it's just me. I guess I'm just a second-rate Christian. Well, we'll address that specifically, God willing, at 9 o'clock tomorrow. So, in other words, the things they tell me to do just don't seem to work for me. I know they should. I guess it's just me. I guess I'm just a second-rate Christian, so they don't work for me. But you know what? I've discovered that labyrinth walking is really refreshing for me. And some of you don't know what that is, but it is you should. 
You should because they're all over Houston and they're growing. A labyrinth is a practice, something, you know, it's an ancient practice, indeed, before the time of Christ. And a labyrinth would be, oh, I guess the average size one would be about the size of this platform here, a circle. If you go to a restaurant where there's paper placemats for the kids to color on while you're waiting for the food, there's usually a maze. And you know what a maze is, right? You come in from the outside of the circle and you weave your way back and forth. You try to get to the middle of the circle. Only they, they block you and try to trick you. Well, a labyrinth would look like that from the top, except there, there are no blocks. It's designed for you to, to weave back and forth uh, through this circle and eventually make your way to the center. And then you do the same thing and then come out on the other side. And it's designed for uh, a slow, meditative, prayerful walking and pausing at certain points and, and praying and, and meditating and um, these are growing rapidly. They're, they're often tiled into the entryway of churches. The Wall Street Journal in December uh, two years ago had a full-page article with accompanying video on their website of people spending up to $125,000 all over America, putting them in their backyards. Newsweek magazine, before it went out of its print uh, edition, had a big article with a two-page two spread showing Jane Bryant Quinn, the famous economist, standing on the banks of the Potomac, where she had a, a labyrinth installed in her backyard, and she said, this was the only thing that got me through the grief following the death of my adult child. Just uh, less than a year ago at Easter in the Louisville paper where, where I live, a church in the Louisville area had announced the construction of a new labyrinth, and they were inviting people of all faiths and no faith to come and explore and enjoy the benefits of the labyrinth. Now, is it wrong in and of itself to walk one like that and, and to stop and pray? No. I think the Bible contrary to that any more than, than it would be wrong to say just walk down a country road and, and pray. And in fact, there's a seminary less than a mile from your seminary in Louisville that has two gated entryways, and in between is a labyrinth. They've installed a few years ago. Just cut a path, I mean, cut one into the ground, they put pea gravel over it, and I mean, there's no maintenance thing. You just mow right over the top of it. But uh, I always take my doctoral students over there to show them this, and they've not seen it before. And I know of a Southern Baptist College in their spirituality class. They take their students to one, uh, at least one particular class did at one point, to introduce them to this concept and in a positive kind of way. I had a word of prayer with a professor of that particular <laughs> class about that. But the point is people will say, I experience peace there that works for me and reading the bible doesn't our other spiritual practices so what do we say what do we say to a jane bryant quinn who says that was the only thing that got me through the grief of the death of my adult son i, I don't know that jane bryant quinn is a professing christian the point is she had this practice i mean a lot of people walk a labyrinth who make no profession of faith and they find that very profitable and helpful and they what do you say? Do you say to Jane Brown Quinn, no, you didn't experience any help from that? And she's going to say, oh, you don't know what I've experienced. I know my experience. You don't. And your argument's not going to argue me out of that. What do we say to that? Well, at the very least, we can say this. It isn't necessary to walk a labyrinth in order to gain the spiritual benefits promised in scripture how do we know it isn't necessary to walk a labyrinth to experience these things it's not in here any spiritual practice not found in here is not necessary even if in and of itself it's harmless and certainly anything would be contrary to scripture would be forbidden 
So if spiritual practices in the Bible aren't working for you, it's either a problem with you or your method of that practice. The Bible claims a sufficiency for every spiritual experience we need to experience God to the full and to grow in grace. So the spiritual disciplines in the Bible are sufficient for knowing and experiencing God and conformity to Christ. Fifth, the spiritual disciplines are practices derived from the gospel, not divorced from the gospel. The spiritual disciplines in the Bible are derived from the gospel, not divorced from the gospel. What does that mean? It means that we don't see the gospel as just kind of the ABCs, and now that I'm a believer, well, I'm, I'm done with the gospel. Now I want to get on to the deep things of God, things like the spiritual disciplines. No, no. We never graduate beyond the gospel. And the spiritual disciplines only take us deeper into the glories of the gospel. So don't think of the spiritual disciplines as something after we've, you know, we've believed the gospel, now we're through with that. We never get beyond our understanding and application, experience of the gospel. And six, the spiritual disciplines are means... They are not ends. Remember, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. We practice the spiritual disciplines not because just by doing them, we're godly. That's it. The goal to practice the disciplines knows they are the means to godliness. And I'm going to develop that. Here's my second point in just a moment. But let me define what I mean when I talk about godliness. It is closeness to Christ and conformity to Christ. When I speak of godliness, Christ-likeness, it's conformity to Christ, a conformity that's both inward and outward. We want to pursue the heart of Christ and the life of Christ insofar as sinful humans can. We want to live like Jesus did, like Peter said, follow in his steps. But we want conformity to the heart of Christ as well. So that's half of it. It's conformity to Christ, but it's also a closeness to Christ, experiencing God. We experience God by means of the God-given spiritual disciplines. So that's what they are. Let me hasten on more briefly to talk about the spiritual disciplines as the means to godliness. The most important feature of any spiritual discipline is its purpose, why it's to be practiced. If you'll notice in the spiritual disciplines book you've been given to, to keep this central Every chapter title has whatever the name of the discipline is, like fasting, and then dot, 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 for the purpose of godliness. Journaling, dot, 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 for the purpose of godliness. Whatever the spiritual discipline is, I remind in the title of the chapter, its purpose is godliness. By the way, let me kind of parenthetically come back to this. Uh, of the spiritual disciplines, and there's no exhaustive list I mean, there are some key ones that all would agree on. There are two that are just organically connected to the gospel. That's the word of God in prayer. Those who believe in the gospel are, are turned into prayers. The Spirit causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. So when you believe in the gospel, you are turned into a praying person. So that's organically connected with the Bible. There are some that aren't taught, but are something like them are modeled in the Bible and a weaker case can be made, but I think a biblical case can be made for something like journaling. In the Psalms, this is David pouring out his heart on God on paper. For David to write, O oh God, how long, O oh Lord, how long will I cry and you will not hear? For him to write that on a piece of papyrus is not very different than you writing out the same words in a Word document. And Jeremiah, when he wrote down his feelings, his laments about the fall of Jerusalem, that's very much like you writing, pouring out your feelings before God on paper. The kings of Israel, when they came to the throne, were required to write a copy of the law in their own hand just to copy Scripture in a journal. It's akin to that. It's not nearly as strong an argument as we can make with many of the other disciplines. And we're not compelled to say, 
we must do that. There's nothing in the Bible that says we must keep a spiritual journal. But I do think we can make a case for something like it being modeled for us. It's, it can be a great help to other disciplines we are to do, like meditate on Scripture. It can be a great tool to record your meditations on Scripture. But why would you ever want to do that? Those who are inclined in that direction, why would you do it? For the purpose of godliness. God uses these disciplines for the purpose of godliness to help mold us in heart and life to Christ's likeness. And this is the way it has always been. You go down through the heroes of church history. You books out there by Dr. Lawson on great heroes of our church history. It's not like God just zapped them in ways he hasn't zapped us. In every one of those cases, they were spiritually disciplined people. All of our heroes we're spiritually disciplined people. Now, God may have blessed them in terms of ministry fruitfulness in ways he hasn't blessed us, but in terms of conformity to Christ, all of those heroes and everyone I've ever known in pastoral ministry that I considered a godly person didn't become godly just because God zapped them in some way he hasn't the rest of us. They practiced the biblical spiritual disciplines, and through those, God developed godliness. That's how he changes people. Now, there are three primary catalysts God uses to change people. One is people. As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another, Proverbs 27, 17 says. He uses preachers. He uses parents. He uses our kids. He uses bosses. He uses employees, teachers, neighbors, friends. He uses people to file off the rough edges and make us more like Jesus. He uses circumstances to change us. We might apply Romans 28, I mean, Romans 8, 28 here. He uses accidents. He uses floods. He uses illness. He uses different circumstances, providences to move us in different directions and to bring about change in our lives. And he uses the spiritual disciplines to make us more like godliness. But there are a couple of difference between, differences between how he choose, changes between people and circumstances and the spiritual disciplines. With people and circumstances, they tend to work from the outside in. He causes the rain to start falling and to keep falling. He brings uh, people into our lives that, you know, we, we wouldn't have chosen to be a part of our lives. But with the spiritual disciplines, he works from the inside out. And more importantly, you have all the choice in the world whether you will get into the Word of God today, whether you will ever miss a meal for the purpose of pursuing God. You'll pick up a Christian book for the purpose of godly learning. And I'm convinced that if we're not voluntarily engaging in these spiritual disciplines that make us more like Christ, God turns the heat up over here. Now, he'll always use people. He will always use circumstances. But if we are not voluntarily engaging in those biblical practices, he is so committed to that plan to make us more like Christ. He's predestined that from the foundation of the world. He sent his son to die to effect that plan, to make his elect like Christ, glorified forever and ever, made like Christ. If we're not voluntarily engaging in those things that make us more like Christ, he will turn the heat up over here. So we want to recognize that even, on the one hand, even the most iron will self-discipline won't make us more like Christ. It may just make us more like the Pharisees who practiced diligently spiritual disciplines. And Jesus said, you're the epitome of ungodliness. But he said, you ought to have done those things without neglecting the weightier matters, justice, mercy, things that were marks of Christ's likeness. The problem with the Pharisees was they saw them as ends, not means. They, you, you check the boxes, you do the disciplines, you're godly. And so today, for someone to think, is, is she a godly man? Is a godly woman? Is he a godly man? Oh, yes. Well, how do you know? Reads the Bible every day, fasts, prays, tithes. The Pharisees did all of that. And Jesus said, you're the epitome of ungodliness. But the solution wasn't to abandon those things. We are to practice the spiritual disciplines, but to see them as means 
to godliness, not ends in and of themselves. The goal is not just to be good at practicing the disciplines. The goal is to pursue God through them, pursue Christ's likeness through them. So the most iron-willed self-discipline won't make us more like Jesus. It may just make you more like the Pharisees, but that doesn't mean we have nothing to do, and we just wait until God zaps us with the godliness. The, the, the way it all fits together is seen beautifully in Colossians 1.29, the very last verse of Colossians chapter 1. Now, when it comes to justification, when it comes to God making us righteous, the theological word that many of you would know would be monergism. The mono one and the, the last part of that has to do is a Greek word for to work. So there's one working. When Jesus came up to the tomb and made Lazarus alive, how many were working there? One. It's monergism. And that's what God did when he came up to the grave and sepulcher of your soul and called you. There's one working. But when it comes to sanctification, Christ's likeness, godliness, we use the word term synergism. And you see this at the last verse of Colossians 1. So the, the question here is, how is it that the spiritual Lisbon's, how, what is God's part and what is our part here? So at the end of verse 28, Paul is talking about the ministry he has of making people mature in Christ. Verse 29, for this, I toil, comma. Thus far, who is toiling? Paul. It was Paul who went to bed tired after a night of ministry, not God. For this, I toil, struggling, and the word means there to work to the point of exhaustion, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So the desire and the power to do this ministry came from God. But it was Paul who was tired at night from doing it, not God. And as Paul lay in bed thinking, I am tired. Am I going to get up tomorrow and do this again? I was persecuted today for what I did. This ministry, I, I, people threw rocks at me. They hated me. Am I going to get up and do it again tomorrow? Yeah. Where did that desire come from? Where did the ability to get up knowing what he was going to face again, where did that power come from? It came from God. But Paul had to get up, and he had to go do it. And the classic example is on a Sunday morning. You wake up, and you think to yourself sometimes, I don't feel like going to church today. Just like your neighbors. But what is the difference? What gives you the desire to overcome the inertia and the ability to throw off the covers and to go through what's necessary to get here? All glory to God, right? And if anything good comes from it, just like Paul's ministry, Paul said God did that. All glory to God. But with the spiritual disciplines, it usually feels like all of you. God doesn't get you out of bed in the morning and bring you over to the desk and put your head down and make your hand turn the pages of the Bible and make your eyes go back and forth. It almost always feels like all of you. That's the way it is with the spiritual disciplines. Just like Paul, for this I toil, struggling with all his power. He gives me the power, but it's still it's a physical struggle. So that if the practice of the physical spiritual disciplines feels like all of you, that's the way it ought to feel most of the time. But where does the desire, the, 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 the affinity for them come from? It comes from God. So think of the spiritual disciplines really just, we think of them as means, as the, as the way you take hold of yourself and bring, you bef bring yourself before God, and God changes you. Just like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wanted to experience Jesus. So what did he do? He knew the path that Jesus was going to take. He took hold of himself and pulled himself into the path of Jesus, and Jesus changed Zacchaeus. That's the way it is with the spiritual disciplines. God has ordained certain paths that he walks. He built them. 
He has ordained them. They're the spiritual Lisbon's in the Bible. And our responsibility, you want to experience God, pull yourself into his path. Pulling yourself into his path doesn't earn his grace and mercy, but that's where it's found. May sound silly, but I think it helps it stick. If I wanted to know what it was like to get hit by a semi, where would I go to find out? What if I said, you know, I believe it's going to be a spiritual experience. This place has been dedicated to spiritual experiences, so I'm going to come here and take hold of the horns of the pulpit here and say, okay, Lord, let it happen. Let the truck hit me. I'm ready for this spiritual experience. What's going to happen? Nothing. Except Pastor Richard's going to call the men in white coats to come carry me away, right? <laughs> why? Because trucks don't run in here. That's why. If I want to get hit by a semi, where do I go? Out on the interstate, right? That's where the trucks run. You want to get hit by the truck of God's Spirit, so to speak? Well, don't expect Him to take a dirt road to you. Now, praise God, we experience Him in unexpected places, in unexpected ways, but the only places we can expect to meet Him on a regular basis are on the highways He has built and that He travels. For example, congregational worship, biblical worship. God has ordained that. God moves in those kind of events, and your job is to pull yourself here. And the fact you have the desire to be here and the power to get here, all glory to God. But you have to be the one who disciplines yourself to get here. And how many times when you said, I don't want to come today, but you do, and you think, I am so glad I came today. I'm so glad I didn't stay home. All glory to God. The whole thing you say is all glory to God, but you still had to discipline yourself to get here. So the spiritual disciplines are means to godliness. They are not ends. Third, and I'm just going to, have to pass over this, it is spiritual disciplines are God's will for every Christian. It's a command. Discipline yourself. That is the will of God. It's not optional. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And it's the same word. In fact, I learned this last night. I didn't realize that the word he mentioned in one place last night is the, is the same, uh, the, the verb form of the same Greek word. It's gymnazo. You can hear the word gymnasium, gymnastics. It's a sweaty word. It has a smell of the gym to it. That's the word describing discipline yourself. That's why the King James translates it as exercise thyself. Very active word. You don't wait for God to zap you for godliness. You discipline yourself. It's a lifelong pursuit of, of, of effort. God-directed, God-motivated effort in God's ways. But godliness doesn't come just by being zapped by the Holy Spirit someday. And that is God's will for every one of us. And I've seen Christians who are very faithful to the church, faithful to serve in the church, but whose, whose life and ministry is so shallow because they're just so spiritually undisciplined. They think, you know, I just can't do that. It's amazing, though. They can be disciplined in terms of academic pursuits or professional pursuits or athletic pursuits or musical pursuits. But when it comes to the things of God, they say, I, I just can't do that. They want to try to read through the Bible, and they get in the second half of Exodus and Leviticus, and you know, so I, I just can't do that. And it's amazing what they can do with other things. I once pastored a woman who's in her mid-60s. She came to me with tears in her eyes, and she said, I said, what's wrong? She said, I know how to do everything in the church. I mean, she'd been a deacon's wife, Sunday school teacher, Sunday school director, missions director. I mean, she, you know, sang in the choir. She'd done it all. She said, I know how to do everything in the church. I don't know how to read the Bible and pray. Spiritually, she was a mile wide, but an inch deep. And that's the way it is with so many, you know, deep, lifelong patterns of depth pursuing the things of God. Well, let me close this now, making this very practical. First, there is danger in neglecting these spiritual disciplines. There's danger in neglecting them. The great danger, the danger of missing God. If you have no aptitude for these things, you have no affinity for the God-given means of experiencing God, you don't know God. 
you don't have the Holy Spirit. And so if you don't have at least some inclination, if you don't lean in towards spiritual discipline, your great danger is missing God forever. You will not see the Lord. But for those who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, who do have an affinity for these things, but you don't practice them diligently, the danger is little spiritual fruit. Your life not counting for much for the sake of the kingdom. That's my great fear. Living a life that doesn't count for the sake of the kingdom. And God blesses Christ's likeness and the pursuit of it. That brings glory to Jesus when we do that. If he blesses your talents and gifts, it's easy for you to steal the glory. And that's a temptation for my students. I see students that come out of the seminary. Man, so many gifts and talents, they come blowing out of there like a steer out of shoot number two, you know? They come out, with go to the big churches real fast, and they've got all these talents and gifts. They win prizes at the seminary, all this kind of stuff. But, and they think, I, I don't need to discipline myself. Look, I got all this great influence from the beginning, and things are going well, and my life is too busy anyway. But their ministry trajectory is, is more like a Roman candle. Boy, they explode in brilliance for a moment, but then they're gone into the night. But I have a lot of students, all they can do is plod. They don't win prizes. They, they make B's and C's. But they can discipline themselves for the purpose of godliness. And though they don't have many talents and gifts, their ministry trajectory is usually like this over a lifetime. Because you know what God loves to bless more than gifts and talents? He loves to bless conformity to his son. That brings glory to Christ. When he blesses your gifts and talents, you can steal the glory. So the danger is the danger of your life not counting for the sake of the kingdom. Second, though, there is freedom in embracing these disciplines. The freedom we long for and to experience the freedom of experiencing God, the freedom in the Christian life comes through discipline. And that should be no, no surprise to anyone. That, that's the way it is with everything, isn't it? Recipes that you used to have to look at every step Ladies, you can do now without even thinking about it, right? You've done it so many times. Computer processes, it may be. You had to look at very carefully every time you did it. Now you can do it without even thinking about it. Why? You've done it so many times. That's the way it is with anything, isn't it? You do something long enough, you've got a freedom. That, that's behind the idea of the 10,000-hour rule, right? For anything to become second nature, for it to become world-class in anything, you have to practice it for 10,000 hours. And there's some overlap there when it comes to the things of God. Who is free to quote Scripture? Only those who've disciplined themselves to memorize it, right? That's the way it is with everything. Whether it's all-star shortstops or moms who manage their households well or successful executives or authors or master craftsmen, the freedom for something to do, just do it kind of well and second nature, so to speak, comes through discipline. You know the name of Christopher Parkening? He's one of America's premier classical guitarists, a devoted believer. I understand he's a member of Grace Community Church for 10 years or more. And if he were in Houston for a concert and happened to just show up here today, and we noticed him, we said, well, my goodness, there is Christopher Parkening. I tell you what, would you close this session out for us, brother? I tell you, we've got a guitar here somewhere, and here's a stool, and would you sit down and finish this part out for us? But I tell you what, just to make it a little more interesting, would you accept a challenge, and would you improvise something? Make up a song on the spot that you've never played before. Well, if he were willing to take that challenge, he would pause for a moment, and then he'd begin to play. And this musical aroma would come wafting out of this guitar as his fingers danced up and down that fretboard. And we'd go, wow, <laughs> how can he do that? Not just a spontaneity, but a beautiful spontaneity. You know where that freedom comes from? It's sitting with that instrument six hours every day for over half a century. That's where the freedom came from. And that's the way it is with everything in the Christian life. You want to know your Bible well? It doesn't happen by getting a seminary degree. It doesn't happen in a short time. It's a lifetime in the Word of God. That's where the freedom, the familiarity of the Word of God comes from. And that's the way it is with everything in the Word of God. And finally, 
there's an invitation to every Christian to enjoy God and to enjoy the things of God by means of these God-given spiritual disciplines. And maybe today there's some discipline God's been putting his hot finger on your conscience for a long time to begin. Or maybe pick up again and blow the dust off and begin again. And you would commit yourself now to that. And lest anyone misunderstand after this message now that you think God will be impressed by your increased diligence in some spiritual discipline and that will make you acceptable to Him. Be reminded that it's only the life of Jesus that impresses Him. But those who love Jesus have the Holy Spirit who gives them an affinity toward the things of God like this. Maybe today is the time to begin or to return to that discipline God's been convicting you about. Let's pray. O Spirit of God, come upon your people. Bring much lasting fruit from this time together. I pray in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.